So feel free to turn off your camera if you don't feel comfortable with the recording today. I'm the moderator for today, so feel free to put any questions, any queries, anything in the chat. We will have a QA and a at the end of the presentation today, so those will be answered then. Um, this will be an interactive webinar, so feel free to ask any questions, put anything in the chat. Um, so I just love to start with acknowledge the people's indigenous land that I'm partially in. It's a great way to start. So um, the organization that I'm representing today is called Kenny Bankport Climate Initiative. The name actually comes from a Mi'kmaq word, which means long sandbar. So that really pertains to the webinar today as it talks about the aquatic origin of um, Kenny Bank. So we're very excited today. We have some great panelists and we have some great organizations. I will start with EcoMain. So EcoMain is in the middle here. EcoMain provides comprehensive long-term solid waste solutions in a safe, environmentally responsible, economically sound manner. And it is a leader in raising public awareness of sustainable water uh, waste management strategies. And they really focus on the reduce part of reduce, reuse, recycle. The next up, I will talk about Rosalia Project. Rosalia Project is an organization that comes out of Burlington, Vermont, that focuses on reducing main debris through sailing research vessels called the American Promise. Rosalia Project protects and cleans the ocean using technology innovations, solution-based research and education STEM programs. They also do solu solution-based science in boats and beach cleanups. They take action on non-sustainable fishing practices and focus on overall ocean protection, and they also do take out their boat on the Gulf of Maine. Um, KCI, which stands for Kennebunkport Climate Initiative, aims to educate, empower, and activate youth voices for climate change with the goal of reaching 10 million youth by 2025. They do this through many educational programs, such as clubs, coalitions, and actions with youth at the forefront. And the last organization on the right there is Maine Energy America Program. The organization focuses on energy efficiency stewardship through the state of Maine and helps to reduce energy costs for all Mainers. Um, with that, I will introduce one of the panelists who will be helping moderate today. Their name is Deb, pronounced um, she or they. Deb is a half-time member serving with Maine Energy AmeriCorps Compact in Orno at the Greater Bangor area. Deb is a recent graduate from the University of Maine, Orono, majoring in biology with an environmental science major. They are very excited to lead a window dresser build in the future in the state of Maine, which will help in other projects to serve underprivileged members in the community. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Deb, to introduce the other panelists. Thank you, Hiromi. All right, so our next panelist is Alan. Alan is from Maryland and is currently studying a degree in history and politics at the University of Maryland College Park. He has a strong connection to his Filipino roots and has often visited the island nation. He talks about how the country is at a higher risk of several climate change risks due to its island nature. And when he returns, he hopes to help the poor through efforts of educating local youth, media promotion and fundraising. He is inspired to help and preserve the world for future generations. Next is Ashley Sullivan. She grew up on an island surrounded by the sea in South Florida and has been involved in design, implementation, and ongoing management of environmental education programs at multiple nonprofits for the past 20 years. She is the executive director of the Rosalia Project for a Clean Ocean, a, long life, a lifelong sailor, ocean lover, and a U.S. CG captain. Ashley's strength as an educator is her creativity and ability to connect with people of all ages. In addition, she is one of the captains aboard Rosalia Project's ocean, oceanographic research sailing vessel, American Promise, and travels the U.S. recovering marine debris and collecting data, sharing the story of the Rosalia Project and inspires people to be part of the solution through storytelling and presentations. And finally, we have Vanessa. She's born and raised right here in Maine. And Vanessa joined the Eco Maine team in August of 2018 to provide education and resources to a wide array of audiences as an environmental educator. From giving tours to conducting trash audits with students, Vanessa's main goal is to encourage others to follow the three R's, reduce, reuse, then recycle. 
She holds a bachelor's degree in elementary education from the University of Maine at Farmington and recently obtained a master's degree in environmental studies and sustainability from Unity College. So those are our panelists. Oh. Oh, there it goes. All right, so this is our agenda. Thank you everyone for joining us. I want to start off by showing you all the agenda for today. The agenda is split up by educating, empowering, and activating. The first item, we'll be learning about microplastics from Ashley from the Rosalia Project. After that, Alan, a KCI youth ambassador, will do a virtual lab with the help of Ashley to teach everyone about microfibers. Next, Vanessa from EcoMaine will talk about her experience working at EcoMaine and solutions for microplastics. Lastly, I will be conducting a Q&A to end the webinar um, with the help of Alan in a fishbowl style conversation. This means you all can ask questions and everyone um, of the panelists will have a chance to answer the questions and give their unique perspective of the question. Feel free to ask anything anytime and Hermi will take them down for the Q&A. All right, next, um, I'll be introducing Ashley and stopping my screen sharing. Um, Ashley will get us started on the first section where she will do a brief educational presentation about microplastics. Hiromi will put the Rosalia Project's information in the chat. Awesome, okay. So I guess that means I am on. Okay, no judgment on my very messy um, Let's see, jump up and play. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, yes. awesome, great. So thanks so much, first of all, for KCI for having me. This is super exciting. This is my first um, youth webinar and I'm really excited to introduce, yeah, microplastics to you guys. So let's go. Um, so an introduction to microplastics. What are microplastics? So microplastics as defined by NOAA are plastics that are smaller than five millimeters in diameter. So think of like a piece of rice and they are created from larger plastics that can break up into smaller pieces. Um, and um, they also can just be designed to be small when you think of microbeads. Uh, microbeads, which fortunately are now banned in the United States. Um, one of the last great things that Obama did at the end of his administration, uh, but they are found around the world in a cosmetics from toothpaste to uh, facial scrubs. Um, and unfortunately they're flushing down our public waterways. So just to take a little bit deeper dive. So we have, uh, microplastics have kind of two categories. So primary microplastics are, as I was saying before, these microplastics that are designed to be small. So up at the top, we have microbeads, these are tiny, tiny, little tiny plastic beads. Glitter is another primary microplastic, something that's designed to be small. So think of glitter like in your arts and crafts, but also glitter is in makeup, um, lipstick, blush, eyeshadow. And lastly, resin pellets. So resin pellets are uh, pre-industrial plastic. So before, let's say, um, you know, um, plastics get injected, injection molded to become like your phone or my eyeglasses, you know, they first start off or a single use water bottle, they start off as a resin pellet. And these industrial uh, plastics are also, um, you know, cr creating quite a bit of a quite a bit of an issue. And then we also have secondary microplastics. So these are um, fragments, so big pieces of plastics that are breaking up into smaller pieces. And then lastly, fibers. And we're gonna be learning a little bit more about, uh, about fibers. So what are microfibers? So microfibers can be as small as three microns in diameter. So if you think that a, hum a human hair, um, you know, just one strand of hair is, is 70 microns in diameter, you can only imagine how small these are. Some of them can be seen by the naked eye, but some of them actually are not as well. They are 
they are ubiquitous um, and they are very, very, very hard to see without microscopes. And so where are they coming from? They are created from our textiles. So clothes, carpets, fabrics. And if you look at the picture off to the left, that is a photo of what microfibers look like magnified. And so to kind of set this up, right? So like, this is my favorite fleece dress. I live in Vermont um, where it is, um, gets pretty chilly. And this is what this dress looks like magnified. So all clothes can shed, but you can see there are certain materials that are more vulnerable, certain textiles that are more vulnerable than others. And the problem is, if I put this in my washing machine, this was a study that was done by Patagonia that one garment, microfiber garment, um, or you know, micro fleece, can create up to 700,000 pieces of fibers that can break off per wash. And this is what the filter of your washing machine looks like definitely not going to be catching these little tiny fibers. Certainly would catch coins, your credit card that you left in your pocket, um, but really uh, not going to catch these little tiny fibers. And this is, again, another photograph of what those fibers look like magnified that are shedding off of our clothes in the washing machine. So when we learned about this problem in 2014, we were like, we need to get out. So that boat that you saw in the beginning, our expedition boat, we went on an expedition to find these fibers in the wild. And this is what they look like in the wild. So super, we did a study in 2016 where we looked at the, the, uh, the entire Hudson River uh, the, the entire Hudson River, which is a very large watershed in North America in the Northern Atlantic Ocean. And what's really interesting about this heat map that you'll see is that, um, you know, in, in, in our hypothesis, we were thinking that we were going to find more fibers in higher density areas like New York City, right? Albany, maybe by sewer treatment plants. But we found, you can see at the very top of the map near Lake Tier of the Clouds, was that the, the, the fibers were everywhere. And this was just surface water sampling every three miles down this river. And so what this taught us, oh, hold on. Let's see, why is my, so this is the area where we found highest concentrations of microfiber. And I don't know about you, but these photos tell me that these are in really remote areas. So we were also thinking, wow, so washing machines may be a source, but if they're getting all the way up in these areas, there must be another source. So I jumped up from my chair, ran outside, and this is outside the bush outside of my dryer. So microfiber, another source of microfiber pollution, and there are a few, we're learning that washing machines are one, but our dryers are also. And this is what the vent of my dryer looks like. So if anyone's ever done laundry and thrown your clothes in the dryer, when you scrape out your lint trap, that's essentially what you're dealing with here. This is, these are microfibers. And so we went back to the Hudson River in 2019 to not only look at microfibers in the water, but also look at microfibers in the air, um, all throughout the water column and all throughout um, and through the soil as well. And what we found is that it is in all these places. So why does this matter? It matters because these fibers are flooding into our public waterways and they are causing, they are bioaccumulating up the food chain. So from the smallest little creatures all the way up. And so they can cause things, they have physical, they can cause physical harm. So they can um, present, you know, they can cause a GI blockage. Imagine, you know, little critters with bellies full of these fibers. It can cause abrasion of their esophagus and also can lead to starvation because they're not processing it. Their bellies are full and they're not getting the nutrients from the food that they're usually eating. Also, 
there are chemicals that are that are on these fibers that are ending up in our waterways, but also if there are any persistent organic pollutants that are in the water as well, think of oils, metals, those can absorb to these fibers. They act as like a vector. And then when swallowed and ingested by creatures, they're then leaching into the tissue of these creatures. And obviously what they eat, if you eat seafood, we eat. And so in a study that was done back in 2015, which is a long time ago at this point, and I can tell you these numbers have come up, uh, Chelsea Rockman, a scientist from the University of Toronto, looked at, uh, went into a, a fish market in Orange County, California, and bought fish right out of the market that was being sold to be brought home and prepared for human consumption. And what she found was that one in three shellfish and one in four finfish and 67% of all the species that she looked at had microfibers in their tissues. And in another study so far, and this number has grown, there have been over 220 plus species in the ocean that have been found to have microplastics in them. So again, from the bottom of the food chain all the way up through forage fish and to predator fish like cod, sea bass, bivalves, um, and um, plankton as well. The images in the right, on the right, or sorry, on the left, were uh, a study that was done in 2013 by a uh, a professor at the University of Exeter. And what he did was he took a bunch of plankton and put in, um, in a lab, put in um, a neon polystyrene. So polystyrene is basically styrofoam, little tiny styrofoam beads, along with other food that these animals, that these critters would be eating. And what he found was that over a three hour period that they were not able to distinguish which was the plastic and which was not. So what you're seeing inside are these neon beads that are that were lit up under a microscope and they are fully ingesting them. It has also been found in um, tap water worldwide at this point at some pretty, um, pretty alarming rates. Oh, goodness. For some reason I get... And it's also being found in bottled water. So bottled water is really kind of no better at this point, right? So 93% in bottled water uh, worldwide. Oops, sorry. It's also being found in our honey. Gosh. It's being found in our salt. And this is about as bad as this talk is going to get. It's also being found in our beer. So the good news is there are a lot of solutions and I'm gonna pass it back over to Deb so that she um, can introduce Alan who's going to do a workshop. So, you know, education is a part of this solution, is one of the many solutions, is educating people about this problem through workshops, webinars, this, um, and also science lab. And then, um, you know, there's lots of other solutions as well that we're gonna talk about in a bit. So thanks so much for having me and I will pass it back over to Deb and stop sharing so I can figure out how to do that. Thank you, Ashley. So next we have Alan who is going to be doing a virtual lab. Um, if anyone would like to follow along, please feel free. If not, um, feel free to watch how Alan does the lab and try it home later. And Hiromi will put the lab in the chat. Hi, nice to meet everyone. My name is Alan Matarang, and uh, I'm here to conduct the virtual lab. So the goal of the experiment uh, will be to uh, simulate a washer dryer, basically. And our goal will be to discover the microfiber output using different variables. And we will see how these variables, such as water temperature, the amount of water, and the cycles impact microfibers. So first of all, let me share the screen with you all. Okay. Um, hold on, this, sorry, the Zoom is blocking my tabs, unfortunately. Sorry about this, give me a, give me a second here.
Okay, here we go. All right, so for starters, um, we are going to need a sealable container and fill it with halfway water. We're gonna need a form of uh, cloth. And I prefer if it was either colored or dark because it's a little bit harder to uh, identify microfibers, which are white. And we are going to need filters, which you're going to draw a kind of a panel on them and two of those. We're gonna need a funnel, a magnifying glass and a larger basin to collect all the water. So, first of all, we are going to fill the, uh, the cup halfway full of water and we'll start off with cold water and we'll only fill it about halfway through. Then we are going to add the piece of cloth into the water. Now, we'll seal it up and we're going to shake it vigorously for about 30 seconds. So I hope you all don't mind a little jukebox hero, you know liven things up a bit and we'll shake it for around 30 seconds. I really give it a good shake too. Fifteen more seconds. All right, sorry to cut that off, but um, that was 30 seconds right there. And so as you could see, uh, examine the water if you can. Notice if there's anything floating around in it. And what we're gonna do now is get the basin over here, make sure it is right below. I'll try to angle my screen a little bit better too. You're going to put one of these uh, coffee filters right over the funnel and try to get it in there as best you can. And we're gonna open up the container. And then we are going to put the water through the filter. Yeah, Alan, for, for this part, would you mind stop sharing so we can just see a bit closer? Oh, yeah, for sure. Thank you. This may take some time to filter, too. And if uh, anyone has any questions they want me to slow down, feel free to ask. So what Alan is simulating is essentially how your clothes, the impact that your washing machine has on your clothes. So imagine that that piece of red fabric is a t-shirt. And so he's just shooken it up and trying to explore the different variables that contribute to microfiber shedding in the wash. Do you know what type of um, fabric you're working with? Like what material that is? Uh, yes, this uh, red piece of uh, fabric is cotton. And all right, just let it drain a little bit more. Okay, very interesting. Some of the water is still in here. I can almost see like a red tinge. Yeah, so I'll try to, here, let me move my computer around as well. But the water is a little murky red. Let me, let me show you. Usually you'll need a microscope to actually detect this. Let me figure out a good angle for this. Sorry, it's a little difficult. All right, I'll just put it up the camera. 
But um, I don't want anything moving around. If you notice, there's a little red tint right there. And you don't even need a uh, a microscope. Yeah, microscope to see it. But okay, so now that we've done that, we're gonna use the microscope to count how many fibers are actually on that little square, which we drew earlier. And I count, so there's well over, uh, there's about 13 or 14, I'd say microfibers. Some of them have actually clumped together into like a larger kind of groups that are a little bit harder to count. And then you see all around, there are very small amounts of uh, microfibers around. I'll put it, try to put it closer to the screen. Yeah, so I'll add, so what um, Alan did there is he drew a two centimeter by two centimeter grid there. So when you're actually draining the water, through the coffee filter, that's an, a way for you to count how many microfibers are being accumulated in the lab. So um, that's actually found in what um, Alan was sharing your screen with, it's in that lab there. So if you all wanna try this at home as well to learn about how your own fabrics create microfibers, that's where that lab comes in that I put in the chat there. Back to you, Alan. Okay. so. We've conducted the first experiment and we noticed there is a lot of microfibers in there. Now for the next part, uh, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna wanna decontaminate the uh, source which we're using because uh, we don't want any like data to be mixed up and it could cause some like roots of error. So I'm gonna wash this out real quick. And uh, I wouldn't recommend using soap just yet because soap could actually be another variable which affects how many microfibers are in each wash. So give me a sec, I'm gonna wash this out thoroughly and I'll be right back. So in the lab, there's actually different variables that may determine how many microfibers come from each wash. So in the lab, it talks about soap, if soap causes more microfiber shedding. It talks about temperature. There are lots of variables that can contribute to how many microfibers um, go into washing. So this is like a hand simulation of how your clothes create these microfibers that end up in your food, that end up in the stomach of fish. Um, so Alan, is actually gonna repeat the experiment because in science you have to do it at least two times. So you're make sure that you get the information um, correct and that you make sure that your hypothesis was correct. Um, and Ashley's done this before with students. And do you wanna talk a little bit how you've done it with students while Alan's watching that, Ashley? Yeah, sure. So what's, you know, as, as Hiromi said, like it, there are so many variables that can contribute to our clothes shedding. So think of, um, you know, powdered soap versus liquid soap, um, hard water versus soft water, a uh, normal cycle versus a delicate cycle. Is the water, um, is it, do you have more water? Uh, are you doing a large load, let's say with only less clothes, um, with only a few items? You know, there are so many different variables. So this experiment is really neat because you can try so many different things. But as Hiromi said, with science, it's really important to, to build replicates to be able to come up with a statistically valid result, right? So if you are gonna try this experiment, I do recommend that whatever variable you change, that you do it at least three times, two, three times, so that you can average out and really have a significant uh, statistic result that will, that will prove whether what, what your hypothesis is, um, is, is, is true or not. So in this case, Alan, what are we gonna change? Okay, so the variable we're gonna change is we're gonna add more water. So I added uh, double the amount of water as there was before. And like they said before, other variables, uh, this is cold water right now, but you could change it to hot water. Um, you could also, like you said, add soap and there's different kinds of soap you could use and how rigorous you're actually shaking it. But we've just added twice as much of cold water. So now we're gonna put this fiber back into here. So let it sit, close the container, and we'll be right back on some Jukebox Hero for another 30 seconds. Give it another good shake.
And why Alan shaking? <laughs> if you all think there will be more microfibers or less microfibers from that, feel free to put that in the chat. Oh yeah, we'd love to hear your opinion. And this is a great hypothesis to test even more results. So feel free to text in the chat. Stephanie says more. Janiki, Rita, ooh, Rita says ooh. less. Okay. And there's no wrong answers here. That's the beauty about doing these experiments over and over again. You learn more every single time. And now we'll start shaking. I like the song choice. Oh yeah, gotta love the classics. About five more seconds. All righty. So that was another 30 seconds. We're gonna let it sit. I'll put it up close to see if anyone notices anything about it. If there's any fibers floating around, if the water looks a little any different. All righty. Now, once again, we're gonna get the second coffee filter with the panel drawn on it, put it back into the funnel and put it under your basin of water. Alrighty, now we begin to pour. Julia, I like your thinking. She's gonna guess more because the cloth has more space to move around in and move more vigorously. Interesting. <laughs> and so the Rosalia project also, um, actually, if you wanna say, uh, gives people kits to be able to do the experiment at home. And when we have more time, they give pumps and the pumps actually help pull the microfibers through um, the filters better. So it has, a, you do need more time for that experiment, but the Rosalia project has a lot of great ways you can replicate this experiment at home. And here, Indeed. are you all sharing the lesson plan and the worksheet? I'll put it back, I'll put it in the chat again. Oh, you already did, great. All righty, so now that this is drained, we're going to take it out and I'll put it up close to the camera again. So David asks an interesting question. Aren't cotton fibers distinct from plastics? I would think cotton would be broken down in an organism or in the environment, but plastic would, would persist. Alrighty. So try to put that as close as I can. So, this uh, filter has a lot less microfibers than the first one. So I'm going to count some of these up. Let's see. Yeah, it, I'd say this has around like seven or eight microfibers but also they're not as clumped together as the first filter was. Like this is a first filter in comparison. 
like you could see that big splotch of red and there's a lot of smaller splotches of red beside it. And then the second filter, you notice it didn't clump up as much. Yeah. And so, and for the best results, it's better to do this experiment probably three times or even more than that. And it's a great way to also experiment with the other variables so you could see the different results. But in this result, there was actually a few less microfibers, but in the first one, they clumped up a little bit more, so it might be a little harder to tell. But um, yeah, so basically, uh, if you conduct this experiment uh, in a multitude of different ways, you could try to find the most efficient ways to limit microfibers in your washing and drying cycles. And um, uh, there's a few ways you could do this even at home. And if you don't have the money to actually like spend for like new filtration systems, there are ways such as like maximizing your wash load. So if you're going to like uh, do a wash, try to get as many clothes as you can in one load. So you try not to waste water and try to limit microfiber pollution as well. Thank you, Alan. And just for time concerns, I'll hand it over to Deb to introduce the next panelist. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, no problem. All right. <clears throat> next, we have Vanessa, who will be empowering the listeners with solution mitigation strategies to fight microplastics. Feel free to write some ideas you might also have in the chat. All right. And I'm just getting ready to screen share here. All right, can you all see that? Yes, okay. Uh, and you can hear me okay. I've had some yeah. issues with that the last couple of calls. So I'm glad you could hear me. Um, so yeah, my name is Vanessa Berry and I'm an environmental educator for EcoMaine. And we'll get right into it because I don't want to waste time. And I know you guys have some great questions. So um, I'm, I'll, without further ado, we'll get started. Um, so I'll talk a little bit briefly about EcoMaine just for folks who are not in the know and are not familiar with EcoMain, um, we're a 501c3 municipally owned nonprofit organization for waste management, which is not very common in the waste industry. Usually it's a, a for profit entity that's handling your trash and your recycling. Um, we are owned by towns, and so we're trying to consider what the most long term solid waste solution is going to be. And uh, sometimes that's not the most cost effective um, or it might cost us money to do the right thing, but we do it anyway. Um, so that nonprofit flexibility and that municipal ownership really does kind of drive our values. Um, and, and you'll see that in some of the work that we do. So we have three facilities which we use to process material um, because it, you know, when you throw it out at the curb, it doesn't just disappear. And uh, we don't want it to become uh, a detriment to the environment as a microplastic in the ocean or you know, out in our native uh, natural spaces. So we have uh, three facilities that help us manage that waste. Uh, we have a waste to energy power plant where we combust household trash at about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it is completely incinerated uh, and it reduces the volume of trash by 90% so that what we do send to landfill is ash and uh, we are able to accept, you know, a hundred trucks of trash. And for that only 10 trucks of ash have to go to a landfill for permanent storage versus, you know, sending that hundred trucks of trash straight to a landfill to be buried into a hole in the ground. Um, we also have our single sort recycling facility. Um, so that's commingled recycling materials that people are putting out in their curbside bins or maybe they're bringing them to a transfer station um, and we have sorting technology and human beings that work in our facilities that help us process all of that material so that it can go into the commodities market to be turned into brand new things. Um, so part of that circular economy um, that relies a lot on our education and, uh, and you know, getting those resources to people to help them do it right. I'll talk about that in a second too. Um, but we're able to recycle quite a bit of plastic material um, I'll talk about that in a second as well. Uh, but we also accept cardboard, paper, um, both ferrous and non-ferrous types of metals, uh, glass, and, um, and then plastics one through seven 
uh, so long as they meet our criteria. So we'll, we'll get there on that. Um, and then we also own and operate our own landfill space. So now we're using it to store uh, our ash and we're slowing that rate of filling um, substantially because we're reducing that volume of that trash. So instead of you know sending raw trash there, we would be closed 15 years ago if we continued to do that. So um, we're, we're finding more sustainable solutions. Um, we process about 175,000 tons of trash in our waste to energy plant every year. And uh, we've got some rookie numbers. We've got about 35,000 tons of recycling that we process each year. Um, and so we really need to up that rate and, and participate a little bit more in our recycling programs to help, you know, keep those going and keep that material out of the landfills. So we've got a few communities in the state of Maine. Um, if you're tuning in from Maine, you can check and make sure that you are or are not an eco Maine community. If you have questions, you can check out our website. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. You can also see here who our owner members are. They're the ones that are flagged in green. Um, we also contract our services out. So we service about a third of the state's population for recycling um, and, and trash services or a combination of both. Um, so part of recycling is, you know, we can only recycle things that actually have a value at the end. Um, you know, it's that cradle to cradle. Um, there has to be a market for materials that we accept. Um, which is why, you know, we have a lot of issues with recycling plastics because not all plastics, um, and I'll get to this too, are designed to be recycled. Um, you know, we can only take what our manufacturers and mills will accept uh, as far as plastics go. And so that limits our ability to really capture that material to the best of our ability. Um, you know, we can only really accept what they'll accept. So we kind of have to pass that on to our residents um, in our communities. But a lot of the plastics that we are seeing coming in and being recycled, um, they can turn into, you know, the, the product that they were before, you know, like a water bottle can become a new water bottle. Um, but a lot of the time we are noticing that some of that stuff is being recycled into um, other types of products. Um, for example, your milk jugs might be recycled into plastic lumber, which would then be like outdoor furniture um, or playground equipment and things like that that might have a longer shelf life um, because plastics can really only be recycled a finite amount of times before they degrade enough and they, and they really can't be recycled again. Um, so we want to make sure that we're giving them their best chance at, uh, at long-term use and uh, moving away from some of the single-use plastics as well. So we want to help everyone recycle. Uh, it, this is a two-part uh, comment. We want people to recycle more. Um, we feel that a lot of, we could, we could be getting a lot more participation in recycling programs. Um, we see a lot of material unnecessarily end up in the waste stream uh, that could be turned into new products. Um, uh, we have three full-time educators in our employee here at EcoMaine that are solely responsible for getting out into the community and teaching, you know, kids how to recycle and why it's important. Um, but we also have lots of resources on our websites and stuff to get to get people active and engaged in the process and, and understand that circular economy that they participate in every time they put something out of the bin. Um, but we also need to acknowledge that not all items are made to be recycled. Um, so lots of different types of packaging are meant to be a one and done. You use it once and it lives forever in a landfill. Um, now that's where, you know, that education comes into play. We want to encourage people to reduce, um, then reuse what they have and then recycle. Recycling comes third for a reason. Um, and that's part of a much larger uh, conversation of, uh, that was uh, kind of established back in the 80s with guidance from the EPA um, called the Solid Waste Management Hierarchy. I've got a slide on that in a second. Um, but just because an item has that chasing arrows in the triangle does not necessarily mean that that item can be put in your recycling bin and turn into something new. Um, so plastics have that resin code, that symbol with a number in it to tell you what the chemistry of the, of the plastic is, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is gonna go and it's gonna turn into something if you put it in a recycling facility. And there's a, there's a chance um, that putting something in there without knowing for sure that it is recyclable 
could cause some problems down the road for recyclers like Ecomain. Um, any time non-recyclable items, you know, from chainsaws and samurai swords to dirty diapers and kitty litter and plastic bags, um, every time those go into our facility, somebody's got to deal with that. Um, it gets tangled up in our equipment or it might create a workplace hazard. Um, it gets picked out manually by workers because we don't have technology to screen that material. Um, and it makes recycling more expensive um, and then therefore less accessible to the public. Um, so we need to make sure that we're dealing with the contamination, keeping it clean, while also fighting and trying to encourage, you know, the higher rungs of that solid waste management hierarchy. Um, we also want to fight for clearer labeling because it's very confusing when you see that symbol on something. And, you know, sometimes we'll see things like place me in your curbside recycling bin. Um, and that's not where it should go. <laughs> so um, we struggle with a lot of that, too. Um, so making sure that we're advocating if you see a company that's putting something on their recycling on this item that says it's recyclable and you know for a fact that it's not, um, you know, reach out to them and or, you know, if you see something that's single use and unnecessary, reach out to them and see if they can cut that out because it's the first step in a much larger conversation about reducing the consumption of materials, particularly plastics with a short shelf life. Um, and then they're forever in our environment. All right, and then so for Ecomain, just to talk about plastics that can be recycled, um, we have a three question test that uh, folks have to kind of comply with in order to recycle it correctly. Um, it's got to have the symbol on it and let us know what the resin code is. Um, it also has to be a rigid plastic. Those get properly sorted um, and not tangled in our equipment. And it also has to be a container. So that's what the market dictates is recyclable and they can turn it into something new. Um, and if it's not a container, odds are it might, you know, go into our paper bales and end up, you know, going somewhere halfway across the country only to be thrown in a landfill halfway across the country. So that's quite a lot of travel and a waste of time and space in a bale that we could be using for perfectly clean recycling. Um, we also have some other resources like our Recyclopedia to help folks. Um, and then to get to some more solutions, we have waste to energy for the non-recyclable plastics. Um, our, all of our trash gets combusted at 2000 degrees. We do have a robust emission scrubbing technology to clean up that material so that we're not putting out a bunch of toxins into our air um, and we're reducing it in volume so that it doesn't sit in a landfill forever just the way that it is. Um, and then we also really encourage folks to, um, you know, advocate for better solid waste policies. Um, there's our waste hierarchy right here. We want to reduce so refuse plastics if you can. If you can bring your own containers, we want you to do that. Um, reuse items you already have to keep them out of the waste stream to need to be disposed of as much as you can. And then rely on recycling, um, composting, waste to energy to deal with your trash, and then landfills as a last resort. Um, and some of that includes advocating for strong policies. So three things you can help us with today. Um, if you don't know where your recycling goes, talk to your town office and ask them. Um, and if you know the facility, contact the facility and make sure that they're actually recycling all of that plastic, that you're not unknowingly putting contamination into the recycling stream. Um, if you are an Ecomain community, you can download our Recyclopedia and you'll get all the answers right there at your fingertips, right on your smartphone. Um, and then the last one is to contact your local decision makers and please ask them to support bills that encourage reduction of waste and recycling, um, whether it's in Maine or wherever you are living, um, and then celebrate those small victories and then thank your legislators for voting for those good policies. So uh, a couple of weeks ago in Maine, we just voted for a really great robust EPR bill. We wanna celebrate our legislators who supported that bill um, and, and give them a big thank you and continue to encourage them to advocate for, you know, the waste hierarchy and for better solid waste practices. Our voices together make a big, big difference. Um, so use that voice and leverage it as much as you can and get to know those legislators and, and you know, call them a lot. <laughs> and that's all I got. Awesome, thank you, Vanessa. Um, now we're going to be doing the fishbowl style of questions and answers. If you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I'm going to be asking the first one and Alan, Vanessa, Ashley, and myself will be answering them as they come. 
All right. So the first one, are the results to the experiment um, that we did earlier located somewhere? I'd love to see what conditions create more or less microfibers. Um, I can answer that. I mean, really this was set up as an educational tool. Uh, so we, um, you know, I have certainly learned a few things um, doing this with students. Uh, but that's a really great idea. You know, there are a lot of studies that have been done around this. So I can certainly um, look to compile them and share and share some with you if that's helpful. Great. Right. Does anyone else have anything else to add to that one? If not, you can go to um, the next one, Deb. All right. Aren't cotton microfibers distinct from plastic? I would think cotton would be broken down in an organism or in the environment, but plastic would persist. Yeah, you know, David, that was an interesting question. And my thought there is that um, the persistent organic pollutants that are in the ocean are, um, they are available to any fiber, whether it's cotton or, um, or if it's a plastic fiber, uh, if it's a synthetic fiber as well. A lot of times cotton uh, may have uh, chemical dyes on the, on the, the textile itself. Um, and it also may have things like, you know, flame retardants or um, other chemicals, wrinkle resistors. Um, and those uh, will um, ultimately can be consumed as well um, by, by sea creatures. So I really think, um, you know, while I'd love to think of a world where we're all wearing organic cotton, and certainly that's that's a that's a great um, opportunity, but not something that's re readily available um, from an equity standpoint for everyone. And I know certainly I've worn wool, and I don't want to go skiing in wool, <laughs> um, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are certain advantages, I think, if you can get your hands, you know, and wear all, you know, linens and organic materials, that's, that would be awesome. But um, there are sometimes even with cotton, um, external uh, chemicals that are put on them and they, those fibers can also absorb things that are, that are floating around in the ocean. Vanessa or Allen? No, okay. All I think right. she nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. What are other ways to reduce plastic or microfibers? You yeah. can go first, Deb, if you want for that one. <laughs> Me? Um, I mean, I think we touched on it earlier um, with the washing doing less or doing larger loads and things like that just being aware, honestly, and educating yourself about it is probably one of the most important things you could do also. I can share a few things regarding microfiber pollution specifically. Um, so, you know, as, as, um, as Deb mentioned, yeah, like using, um, you know, using, putting more, washing less, right? Wearing your clothes more, not just washing them, wearing them once and, you know, washing them again, um, doing full loads versus uh, um, washing as, as many clothes as you can, you know, really kind of packing it in. We, we do know that um, that liquid soaps um, create less abrasion than powdered soaps. Cool water um, creates less abrasion than hot water. Um, you know, a gentle cycle versus a heavy duty, duty cycle as well. We also know that that um, if you have an opportunity or you're getting ready to switch out your washing machine, that um, front less water. And so they're creating, they do create less fibers than like the old school um, top loaders. Um, you know, and then there are some external things, if it's something that you're really concerned about, there's a few consumer scale solutions. One of them is the core ball, which is a microfiber um, laundry ball that Rosalia Project invented. And I can put a link to this in the chat. It has an efficacy of about 31% um, reduction of fibers per load. Um, 
you know, there's also another item called the guppy friend. It's almost like a lint bag, like a delicates bag that you put your clothes in. Um, and then there's the lint lover, which is, which is an external filtration device. And I can put all three of these in the chat. Um, that is a little bit more expensive. You also need a, um, you need an, a plumber to come in, an external, like a plumber to come in and install it. You may have a space issue um, and to be changed out. Uh, the filter does need to be cleaned after every wash or you could end up, you know, flooding your laundry space. But, um, you know, there, so there are, there are things that we, that we can do. That's a great question. <laughs> I don't know, Alan, um, can I just answer that question, Deb? I want to say, Lexi, if Vanessa or Alan wants to add anything, if not, we'll, we'll end with that question. Vanessa or Alan? Lint? The question about lint? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can handle it. So I, I would advise throwing that in the trash um, just because of the, you know, a lot of the clothing that we're dealing with now does have a lot of microfibers that shouldn't be composted um, or anything like that. And I know, you know, back, back, kicking it old school with clothes that used to be organic cotton and natural fibers you could compost those um but now with synthetic fibers entering the the picture it's not really a possibility so unfortunately those should be best disposed of in the trash awesome we have one question that we did miss how, what can we do to lessen the microfibers we produce in laundry? I know Ashley did talk about that a little bit earlier. Um, does Alan want to touch on that at all? Um, yeah, just relating to uh, earlier what they said about like the washing drying machine cycles, try to maximize your loads, uh, rewear clothing, um, really be like self-aware of just kind of like, I mean, everyone will wear what they want to wear, but just try your best to uh, just limit your loads and be aware of how much water and how much microfiber is going into each wash. All right, thank you. That looks like the end of the questions. I will pass it to Hiromi for some closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. I know this, this hour went by really fast, so I'm gonna just end by sharing my screen one more time. All right, so the biggest way that you can mitigate for microplastics or plastics is really take action. You can take action becoming a KCI ambassador, for example. On our website, under the action page, we have all these different categories of different climate change based issues. Under oceans, we do touch base a little bit on microplastics and microfibers. So um, go to our website, learn more about what you can do, personal action, statewide action, countrywide action on our website. Or you can also connect with the partners that were part of this webinar today. So we have rosaliaproject.org, EcoMaine, and MainCompact.org. Rosalia Project also has some great opportunities for youth ambassadors to get involved with their cleanups. Um, so feel free to contact any of these organizations, become a KTI ambassador to join some more webinars and talk more um, to the people in your lives about this issue. I thank you all to our panelists today and thank you all for coming. So that's it, goodbye. <laughs>